So I'm here with Tom, and I'm we've, I've sort of flipped the mic on Tom because I'm interviewing you for your podcast. Yeah, in fact, you didn't let me say welcome to Under the Scales, <laughs> but it's okay. Uh, I'm here with RJ and uh, my good friend RJB, who's uh, the helping friendly pod voice that you might recognize, but also a co-founder of Osiris with me. And that reminds me. Under the Scales is a proud member of the Osiris family of podcasts. If you enjoy this podcast, go to OsirisPod.com and check out other music and culture podcasts. How'd I do, RJ? Pretty well. All right. You passed. Okay, good. <laughs> because there's a legal you know, requirement, we have to say that. Yeah, or you go to jail. <laughs> you don't want to go to jail. So um, on, on this important occasion, and I don't think we have the date exactly right, but Roughly 20 years ago, what happened, RJ? Well, October 27th, 1998, the Story of the Ghost album was released on Electra Records. And you and I started talking a few months ago about talking about maybe the lyrics and looking back at the album 20 years later. Amazing material that's still obviously in rotation today, and I wanted to kind of talk to you about it. It's just got this really good progression and a really great sound. Well, so... Maybe we can talk a little bit, Tom, about um, just from my perspective as a fan, you know, during this time when Story of the Ghost came out in 1998, this was incredible peaks for Fish. And at the same time, you and Trey were writing, uh, I mean, dozens and dozens of songs that ended up on um, Story of the Ghost, Farmhouse, The Sick of Disc, uh, some, and then Trampled by Lambs, of course, was sort of a lot of outtakes, um, which still holds up today. Um I guess my first question is just what was the songwriting process like at that point when you guys were 97, 98? I assume Fish was on the road more. I know you had just had kids. Um, Trey had just had kids. It seemed like you guys were producing a lot of material given all the things you all had going on in your lives. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, There's probably 20 questions in there that you just asked me. (laughs) But yeah, so uh, 93 and 96, my kids were born. And so there were things keeping me home things keeping me off the road, things keeping me um, from writing music with Trey as much as I would like. Um, But let me set the scene a tiny bit differently. So Trey and I, when we were back in uh, Princeton Day School um, era, we would write songs in his dad's basement or in one of our basements, and we would strive to multi-track. So uh, that would be we would come up with an original song, lay down a track, often bass or guitar, um, and then we would add the next uh, instrument often, and then we would sing and add harmonies to that. So leaving a whole lot of history behind because we don't have time for that right now. Um, Trey lived in Vermont, and I lived in New Jersey. And the way that we wrote was I would send him lyrics, and he would create and craft the song entirely himself. Often he would call me for suggestions. Hey, Tom, this doesn't work so well. Uh, Could you give me another verse here? That kind of thing. Or did you really mean for this to be the chorus? And do you mind if I switch up from this other poem that you sent? Do you mind if I toss this in here? That kind of thing. After a while, Trey would just sort of kind of liberally grab stuff from different poems. Every now and then he would tweak where I thought maybe that poem was meant to stay together. And then he would respect it. And similarly, would you know, rarely would he ever have to sort of rebuke me. We had this like open uh, forum, no ego, always. So that was like writing by the phone. <clears throat> and we always wanted to get back to the place that we had started, which was writing in the same room with the multi-track where I'm pressing pause record and Trey's playing the instruments <laughs> and I'm supplying the lyrics. And when we're in the same room, we write really well. So if you can think of the album progression, um, Lawn Boy, I had three songs on, um, and then it was Picture of Nectar, I had four songs on, and then this amazing thing happened with Rift, this like proliferation of uh, creativity, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I was always just writing constantly, uh, I give the creative credit to Trey, 
because his music style varied so much and changed and everything. And, and somehow he was able to, out of my weird lyrics, create an album which was a concept album and held mm-hmm. together, even though I didn't know that he was crafting it. My right? favorite Fish album. Uh, really? By far. Yeah. Still? Okay. Absolutely. Well, that's an amazing thing. And then after that followed Hoist. Hoist had this song called Life Boy on it, where I think Trey and I finally realized just by virtue of how many phone calls back and forth it took to write that song, that we got to be in the same room because we were virtually in the same room by technology. Why don't we actually just get in the same room? So that began the impetus to uh, write songs together. So Trey booked a vacation in the Cayman Islands. We both had our scuba certificate and we went to the Cayman Islands and we wrote a lot of the songs that wound up on Billy Breathes. And including theme from the bottom, you know, it has, we scuba dove all day and then came home and wrote and understandably there's a water, there's a water theme to that one. So, you know, our, our, our heads were now churning fish was like igniting into the, you know, the solar system and beyond into space as a band and learning from each other and how to play together really incredibly, like unlike any other band. And I think Trey's drawing on me and, and pushing me to be more creative lyrically uh, kind of hit this really amazing peak right when we were uh, in three farmhouse sessions and every one of those songs is on trampled by lambs and pecked by mm-hmm. the dove. Mm-hmm. Um, some never made it into fish song hood at all. Um, but for the most part, if you look at that track listing and I think there's 25 or 26 songs on there, um, a lot of the, songs make up the contents of story of the ghost and farmhouse yeah and by the way that's a good it's still a good listen they're like they're um it has like a nice rustic feel to it and i'm trampled Trampled by lambs yeah i think they're it's amazing so tramp trampled by lambs and pecked by the dove you might be able to get it like on amazon or something uh or spotify i'm not quite sure but i know on live fish they you can get that's where i listen to yeah you can get the whole collection together and those songs uh, thank you for saying that the 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 thing about those songs is that's how we wrote we we did the entire song we completed the entire song we were completists and so we wanted to finish and and so when you hear various songs on there like brian and robert are waiting in the velvet sea it's like we had all the parts Mm -hmm. already done and and that's something that people don't often know so tom i got some uh, input on these questions from uh jonathan and matt from hf pod and one question they had was this is sort of a combination of a couple of questions but the um the lyrics that you hear on the story of the ghost songs are a little bit more um dark a little bit more spiritual a little bit more haunting they feel different than what you heard on billy breeze or the stuff on hoist or before I'm just curious, was that reflective of where you guys, you and Trey were, you were at the time, or was that just, is that just how it played out, I guess? Uh, interesting. I think some of the, the concept album aspect of Rift sort of told this story, kind of a little bit of a macabre version of a relationship gone, gone afoul. And um, it struck something in me, I think, uh, from my past. And I thought, you know, those places where like maze and 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 rift where some of this kind of complex imagery but sort of like a, a of a dark place of a of a chasm that you're looking into or people watching you fail um i think came from my dad used to read to me edgar allan poe mm. and we would love love sort of the dark uh I don't think you have to be a dark person to enjoy opening up the dark side of your brain. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so uh, because of Rift, it sort of gave me a little bit more license to sort of go there. Of course, then uh, Billy Breeze happened and we were like happy, like scuba diver uh, <laughs> beach goers. So it didn't really come out there. Um, but yeah. And then uh, simultaneously for Story of the Ghost and some of those sessions, I think I did draw more heavily on that side of my on my brain. Uh, also, Emily Dickinson is a huge, she had this like obsession with death mm-hmm. and her, her death in particular. Right. And, uh, it comes through in the most unbelievably artistically beautiful haunting way. And I kind of strove for that. And, um, 
you know, if that comes through even 2%, then I, then I feel like mission accomplished. But specifically the song Ghost, uh, and I've told this before, um, it, it reflects sort of a, an experience in my childhood, uh, you know, or it reflects my childhood where I kind of felt like I was tapping into, and I'm not religious at all, and I also don't really call myself that spiritual apart from this sort of period of my life where I was actually invoking, uh, I was actually talking to some entity and it was actually helping me get through life. Wow. Briefly. Right. Was that in this house that we're sitting in now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can go to the room where the spirit. It's terrifying. Yes. So, and I called it my spirit. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, I'm going to fast forward through this because I've told it before, but basically I found the person in eighth grade at Princeton Day School, mm -hmm. and Trey knows him, mm -hmm. is it my friend Phil Dimonadier. He housed my spirit and proved that he did. Uh, it's very, very strange. Uh, <laughs> it's really bizarre. But that's what the song Story of the Ghost is about. And I wanted to tell Trey that complex narrative. And the only way I kind of could, like I feel I've never told mm -hmm. you the story mm -hmm. of the ghost, um, is really me trying to explain that to my good friend Trey. About my other good friend, Phil. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it ended up as one of the funkiest anthems of, of Fish. So <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> and like songs like, you know, Brian and Robert and Waiting and a couple others. I can hear now that, that Emily Dickinson and Edgar Allan Poe um, influences with, you know, loneliness and, and sort of solitude and yeah, Brian um, and Robert, loss and, for you know, sure. that sort yes. of stuff. Yep. Um, it's cool that you're able to kind of tap into that and you don't hear that in the songs you've written more recently. Your songs more recently are a little bit more like looking, almost looking back on your, what's, what's happened thus far and, and what lies ahead. That's my interpretation anyway, but we can, we can save that for another time if you want. Yeah, sure. Let's save that for another time. Uh, that's interesting that you've analyzed it in that way. Yeah. So we should get into more detail on the story of the ghost, both the writing and recording of it. Um, is there any, is there anyone you think we should bring into the conversation that might have some particular perspectives on this? I could talk a lot about the story of the ghost and I could talk about the two days that I was at Bearsville when they were recording it, mm -hmm. but there's someone whose phone number I have <laughs> and who's a good friend of mine who knows so much more about it. So let's call up Trey and see if he's willing to talk about it. Let's do it. Hey, Trey. So it's Tom. How are you? How's it going? And I'm here with uh, my friend RJ, whom you know from Osiris and also you know from the Helping Friendly podcast. Hey, RJ. Hey, Trey. Nice to talk to you. Thanks for taking the time. So nice to talk to you. So, Trey, um, we wanted to congratulate you on the 20th anniversary of the story of the ghost. And that's why RJ's here in Princeton with me right now. Um, he's been interviewing me and asking me a couple questions and it rapidly became apparent that why not just call a person that knows so much more about it <laughs> than I do. Sure. I'd love to. I, by the way, I had no idea that it had been 20 years, which is it's amazing. Crazy. Right? So yeah. thank you for telling me that. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Oh 1998, <laughs> 20 years ago, we, we had some amazing fun in an incredibly prolific period and it hasn't stopped yet. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, um, that was a that was a very fun period. Amazing, and incredibly fun for me and you, Tom. Too uh, really, you know, really fun. Everybody, yeah, life changing, and uh, it keeps keeps changing, which is incredible, and and yeah, keeps morphing for the better, which is unbelievable. So RJ has the first actual official question. <laughs> so why don't we start there and see what happens? Sounds great. Yeah, so I want to get both of your takes on this, but maybe starting with you, Trey, you guys were just referred to this as sort of a prolific period. I know that some of the stuff that was written during some writing sessions in 97 ended up on Story of the Ghost, but that was sort of the tip of the iceberg from what I understand. You guys had tons of songs that ended up on Farmhouse um, and then outtakes on Trampled by Lambs and a lot of stuff that didn't make it on albums. This is just incredibly productive time for you guys. Fish was getting much more popular. You guys seem to be hitting creative peaks, both on stage and in songwriting. I just, I'd love to get your take on sort of what that was like at that time. Yeah, it was, um, it was an incredibly exciting time. I actually was thinking before you guys called, it was also, um, 
I got married in 94 and had my first, we had our first child in 95. We had our second child in 97. And, and Tom, you and I were writing so much. We started going on these songwriting trips and the three that we did in 1997 were to a, um, uh, we rented a farmhouse and um, we went to three different weekends and wrote a whole lot of songs. They all are documented on that Trampled by Lambs and Pecked by the Dove album, which was, by the way, never intended to be an album or intended to be heard by anyone. So we didn't, we didn't, you know, put any effort into making it sound good or anything. It was just actual documents of us writing the songs. And what happened after that was um, we went in, we were going to go in in 1998 to do Story of the Ghost. And shortly before we went in, I wanted to kind of, um, extend the same fun to the three guys in the band because me and tom had just been like writing so many songs we wrote in those farmhouses we wrote bug and twist and heavy things and and farmhouse and limb by limb and it was a very prolific time there are dozens dozens of songs that came out of those dozens and so before we went in for story of the ghost there was sort of two main ideas thrown out to the between the band um, guys the first was to go back to another farmhouse with just the four band members so we rented a it was the fourth farmhouse weekend we rented a farmhouse because i wanted to make sure that everybody had a chance to write together it wasn't just me and tom um and we took this book of of sort of lyrics and sketch ideas that um tom had it was sort of a document of some conversations between him and and our friend Scott Herman mm-hmm. and and also just poems that Tom had written. So Scott Herman and I at AT&T had all this documented and saved in email. And so Scott put it in a database and then we we like deleted a whole bunch of really really horrible like yeah <laughs> stuff but also also all our email about, you know, where do you want to meet for lunch? And what was left, we actually put in a book uh, called The Salamander Prince, which is uh, a, a character in one of the poems that, that was in the book. And then we gave that to you. Right. And so I had been writing previous to the farmhouse and the trip that preceded Billy Breeze, which was came, we went to the Cayman Islands and we wrote Waste and came in review and all that stuff with Tom and I in the same room. But previous to that, because in 94... We hadn't been able to be together. Uh, we hadn't been able to spend as much time together as we had since we were in fifth grade. I was using the Salamander Prints to write songs, mm-hmm. sometimes taking one line from a poem and combining it with another one. It was very free flowing, you know what I mean? Or adding lyrics or something. So what happened after Tom and I had these three amazing weekends in the farmhouse? I asked Beth Montori, who works in our office, to rent one more farmhouse before we went in to do Story of the Ghosts. And it was this guy, Davo, rented us his farmhouse, Davo's farm. And we went in there with the same setup that Tom and I always had, a teeny little drum set, a, a little mini keyboard, and a and an eight-track machine. Mm-hmm. And we sat around, uh, the four of us, writing songs. And there was a couple that came out of that that ended up on Story of the Ghosts that I absolutely love from that session. Uh, one of them is Meat, and one of them is Rogue. Mm-hmm. Incredible. Um, and Frankie Says. Frankie Says, and Shafty, which was actually on, I think, Trampled by Lance by Pecked by the Dove. That was kind of already written by Tom and I, but we just changed the groove. The thing about Rogue and the thing about Meat is they both kind of exemplify what was going on between the four band members in that farmhouse. and um, Because... We had one mic, right? We had this book. So, you know, we'd get this little groove going. It's very small, like just like... And then, you know, we'd throw the mic at Fish and he would kind of flip through the book or something and like pull out a line. The circus is the place for me. And then he'd like throw the mic, you know, with bears and clowns and noise. And he'd throw the mic at me and I would like add a line. And then it was the idea was trying to... I think there was a, a a real conscious effort at that right at that moment to fan the flames of the group mind, group think concept. It was in the writing, in the playing, all of it was it was very, very conscious effort at that time to push that feeling of this like tapestry sound of the band with layered vocals and stuff. I love the way that you describe that, and I don't think anyone has ever heard that before. 
Um, uh, but one of the things that does that you can see if you go to Wikipedia or if you have a copy of Story of the Ghost is every single song is a collaboration. There's not just one that's you know just Anastasio or McConnell or or Gordon or right or Fishman. Every single thing and a lot of them, more than half. There's 14 songs on the album. Eight of them are full band collaborations, which is amazing. There's one other thing that was happening that 97. So 97 was a really good year for Tom and I. We wrote a lot of songs that I still love in those farmhouses. 97 was also a really good year for the band. I thought we were playing well and kind of breaking through. I think we all did. So the two things that we did before we went into Story of the Ghosts were one, the four band members recreated the thing that Tom and I had been doing since, to be perfectly honest, since before there was a fish. Mm -hmm. So we wrote together in the farmhouse, which resulted in Rogue and Meat. And then the other thing we did was we set up in Studio A of Bearsville mm -hmm. and decided that we would just jam for, you know, like four or five days before we even met, you know, our engineer or got going on the album. It was just to sort of try to bring the live feeling into... A studio album. The recording process. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. Yep. So a lot of those jams, 90% of what happened in those jams really ended up being the Sicket disc. Mm -hmm. um, one of the jams is still one of my favorites from that jam session before Story of the Ghost, which is uh, What's the Use, um, which I still love. But it's a that beautiful always song. Brings me back to that time. <laughs> It's one of my favorites. It was a it's a good one. It's a great one. That's a fan favorite, and and no one oh, knows. Good. No, no one <laughs> knows too. that it had words. <laughs> <laughs> right. It did have words for a while, but then it, they went away. Yeah, <laughs> I have to say, Trey, it's amazing to me every time you guys play it live because I get to see it from the opposite perspective that you see it. it. The the quiet parts, everyone is completely silent, and I don't know if you can tell from the stage, but during what's the use? It's it's it, Madison Square Garden, Kurt uh, Magna Ball, whatever it is. It's completely quiet, and I think that's really amazing. Wow. Yep. I love that. I think I can feel it more than kind of hear it. <laughs> right, right. Anyway, and that was the that was the process kind of going in. It's wonderful. So it it's wonderful, and it can and it made a completely interestingly uh, unique album, just completely born of collaboration, and that was the intent going in. And it's apparent, and it and it's wonderful. And and Fish is a collaborative band in every respect, and so this, in a way, is a is a portrait of fish from the studio, which is so cool. I, I think that's true, Tom. And it's, it's, it, it was also involved, of course, you. And also, like I said, that organic, you know, when we write together, you have always had a totally open philosophy about any kind of editing or rewriting or line adding or paragraph adding from my end. Yeah. And it would be probably hard to explain what happens like in that farmhouse when we write together or in that, you know, in that house by the beach when we write plays on or something like that. But, but to me, it's just like so unique and special because we've been doing it our entire life. And, and what often ends up happening is that we'll come in and you'll come in with poems and I'll come in with like pre-prepared, you know, like, you know, chord progressions and beats and then we'll start, we'll write a song and then it loosens up and then we'll write another song. And then by the end, like for Blaze On, we're both standing up, screaming at each other and just laughing, like falling over and just like <laughs> leaping around. It's like a jam. You know what I mean? Amazing and, and thing. That, our, our album, we have a listening party at the end. And we, we one of the big things that, that we've talked about this before, I believe, but um, Trey, one of the reasons we, we only have eight tracks, you know, we could have 64 digital tracks. We could have unlimited digital tracks if we wanted to. Uh, one of the reasons we do eight is because it makes us think very hard, leave room for that last harmony, leave room for that guitar mm -hmm. solo, leave room for the drums. Trey wants to, you know, put an extra percussion, uh, you know, and so... If, if it were unlimited, we probably would just never, ever finish a song. But this way, we move on. And when we do, we really move on. We don't listen to it for the whole session until the very end. When all the songs are done, we have a listening party. And that's exactly what Trey's talking about, <laughs> where we are literally screaming in laughter and delight, like, oh, my God, I completely forgot about this song. <laughs> and, 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 and a lot of them are like, you know, the ones that come out of the vapor always seem to be the best ones. Like an example of that would be uh, the last time we did a session, we wrote a bunch of songs 
And then right at the end, we're like fooling around with this groove. I had this idea for, um, well, it's for everything's right. Oh yeah. And then I was like, Tom, <laughs> I, I was like, what do you like? What do you really feel? And you had a pad, remember? And you like wrote a couple lines down and like I started yelling out a couple lines and, and you wrote that great line about the mirror secret is I'm losing my hair. Yeah. <laughs> and it was all just like, like reality and fast. And, and, and the two of us were like, you know, we were banging on the kitchen pots and pans and, you know, like opening up and the, the, you know, it's all because of the way that we've been doing this our whole life. It never feels like we're actually writing a song. Like until it's, until, like you said, we have the listening party at the end and you're like, Oh my God, that actually is a song. I thought it was just like, uh -huh. <laughs> right. And I, I got to tell you this too, because I just was thinking about it. There's one really crazy example of that on Story of the Ghosts. And what's that? Which is that, which well, there's a line that Fish sings, okay? <laughs> and it's in me, right? Mm -hmm. And this is how, this is how. I just felt like my heart stopped beating. Yes, which is, he goes, like, <laughs> and that was like in your notes. Yes. Right? Yeah. But, but it was, so like, we're doing meat and it's like three different things all combined. Yes. There's like, if I had a host of ghosts, which is kind of like from one. And the other oh, guys are going, just just and then there's, stay yeah, alive. then there's that one. Yep. And then, and then fish goes, I just felt like my heart stopped beating. I just thought that you heard me laughing. Um, why'd you put the pillow on it? Yeah. Which is actually with you and I were like 15 years old or I don't know, 16 or something. Yes. And like we had taken mushrooms. Yes. At your dad's, and, uh, your dad's house. And, and no, he was trying to call me. <laughs> <laughs> and you remember that we were at my house and we were in the living room and, and we were like in the middle of this songwriting thing, which I think I'm actually sure was I am hydrogen. Yes. It was like, wow. we were like, you were playing the keyboard and I was playing the guitar and we were writing I am hydrogen. Do -do, do -do. And then, but we were kind of, you know, a little, you know, in a funny headspace. And then the phone started ringing and I didn't want to answer it. And it was like the I phone thought, in the beginning of Chinatown, that Jack Nicholson movie. It just doesn't stop ringing. <laughs> it just kept ringing. And, and you know you have to stop. answer it eventually. And the more it rang, the more I thought it was like a tragedy that I didn't want to deal with because right. we were having so much fun writing, <laughs> like writing I'm Hydrogen. So I kept piling the pillows on it. And then that moment was, I just felt like my heart stopped beating. I thought you heard me laughing. Yeah. You know, why'd you put the pillow on it? Yeah. <laughs> and then I thought like years later, Fishman was singing it in me. <laughs> wow. So it was like one songwriting session cross talking with another songwriting session. The, the reason best. that story is like so cool is because that really describes the entire like fish community of collaboration. It's just such a like such a bizarre high level of of like tapestry of collaboration. Hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. and like stuff you guys are doing at work. I know the whole thing is just it's incredible. Uh, so I totally agree. It's the epitome almost, <laughs> uh, you know, that that a, a session can can bleed into another session and then Fishman can grab it and it makes perfect sense in the song Meat. It's amazing. It, it all makes sense. It's weird. <laughs> so anyway, well, that's a long one. Trey, I, I would be an irresponsible fish fan if I didn't say that you slightly underestimated the 97 um, sort of playing when you said, I think we were playing pretty well back then. Um, cause that's, that remains many of our, you know, favorite, one of our favorite times as, as fans. So it's cool to hear how that came together and how that influenced songwriting and vice versa. Cause it does seem fairly symbiotic in a lot of ways. Oh, thank you so much. We were the good people. Yeah. All of us longtime fans, we knew the afterburners had come on in, ni in 97. It, it ignited, everything was changing. And yet we were really lucky that we had you and me had gone on that Cayman trip and realized the benefits of writing together. And that started an, our new era of writing. Cause prior to that, I mean, we had a really good album with Rift, but that was done completely separately. Right. And, and, you know, I would write the lyrics True. and send them to and you. Hoist. Oh, and hoist too. and hoist completely separately. And I think, yeah. believe it or not on hoist, I think it was life boy where you and I realized like we just called each other 30 fucking times to write that one song, we should really be doing this in person like we used to in the old days. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I remember writing Life Boy. We, we called each other 30 times in one day, yeah. like every day. <laughs> yeah. Like I kept calling you back and like we were just, but it was cool, it was crafting and- Amazing. But you're right, and then, and then it's true. Since then, I think we've kind of made a point to 
be together. We would go, you know, someplace where we could just be alone and maybe be outside by nature. There were a lot of times we would pick our places because of nature. And, and like, you know, like the farmhouse night, we, you know, we got there and the Northern lights were out. I had never seen the Northern lights and you had never seen the Northern lights. And we opened that sliding glass window, this beautiful old farmhouse. And we were just like singing what was actually happening. Yeah. Like it wasn't even a, the two of us, you know, and the one that I remember from that is on story of the ghost that just, God, it gives me chills remembering it. That <laughs> was, um, when we were in that other farmhouse and we had, it was the same night we wrote Twist and Velvet Sea, right? Right. And um, we were in that, there's like bags of chips all over the place and junk food and our little fender ramp and two of us just staying up for three straight days and just kind of writing, writing, writing. And you would play this little thing on the piano. And then all of a sudden we were standing next to each other and we had been writing for three days. Like, so we, that always felt like a, like a like a cocoon, like just the most loving cocoon that we were in. And the two of us were going with one microphone holding it. Do you remember this? We we're like, I've been waiting in the velvet sea. I do. I've been waiting in the velvet sea. And then you sang that lead vocal. <laughs> and it was like my favorite memory because, I mean, I love that song uh, so much. And I don't know how much of it is because it's connected to that memory, but it was such a like a verbal description of what we had been doing, mm. <laughs> like locked in the darkness, you know, yeah. just writing music, just writing music and writing music and writing music together and yep. one song after another. And it was like, all of a sudden we're standing there doing those backup harmonies. <laughs> and that song, again, it felt like it just kind of emerged. Yeah. Anyway, that's, that's on the record. Yeah. That's on Story of the Ghost. Absolutely. Yep. I have tears in my eyes, Trey, uh, from you telling me this. So one of those sessions uh, was Ghost. Let's start right at the top. The song okay. Story of the Ghost. I I feel I've never told I've never told you the story of the ghost and I really we, I really wanted to tell you and that's how I told you in lyrics. Yeah, yeah. We were we had written that one somewhere and I think you had written that about your friend Phil Dimenadie. But like, I always tried to um I feel think about my own thing so like I always like the two perspective thing I think some of the kind of editing it wouldn't be editing would be the right word, but the pushing and nudging back and forth that I think has always worked. I always thought, and I've always, I still, I remain thinking this, that if I know what I'm singing about, like Mary was a friend I they'd say is my friend, Mary Johnson. It wasn't <laughs> written. It's not Mary Johnson. It's about somebody else, right. but to me it is. Yeah. <laughs> so I figure if there's two different perspectives, then the fan, you know, some, the mm -hmm. third listener mm -hmm. that will then have, will have an easier time creating ownership. And I know both of you and I have often talked about trying to keep things from being completely nailed down. Oh, yeah. We don't spoon feed uh, musically or lyrically. But also the amazing thing is what you just referred to is, uh, you know, and I think everyone would think that you and I have a solid vision of what that song's about when we come out, at least the two of right. us. And we don't because we even have our own interpretation, which is amazing. I think we try to push it that way. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, Story of the Ghost. I want to say one other side thing about Story of the Ghost on Story of the Ghost, the, the first track, <laughs> is that we got to work with um, Andy Wallace, is the guy who mixed and engineered that record. Um, he's He is an incredibly talented guy that we wanted to work with, all four of us, because um, he had engineered and mixed Nevermind. He had engineered and mixed, most importantly, Slayer, Rain and Blood. <laughs> and, and also um, that I'm Grace by Jeff Buckley. We were huge fans of his. And uh, so I, I don't know. I always thought that it was a really great sounding first track. I mean, I like the way the bass sounds a lot. And... Like right when the album kind of starts off, it's got this cool, 
uh, everybody in the band is kind of uh, part of a machine. Mm -hmm. Boom, that was something that we were really discovering in 1997. And I thought that track did a pretty good job reflecting what we were kind of into at that time. Cow funk, you Vermont, know? Vermont funk. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. You know, and the same thing on Birds of a Feather. You can hear it on that too. Mm -hmm. Well, there we go. It kind of chicka, 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 chicka. You know, what, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yep. And but and Andy was great. At, he was very, very helpful in getting that sound. It's easy sometimes when you just coast along. Like it or not, something always seems to go wrong Sometimes people build you up just so they can knock you down It was definitely kind of a cool hang. You know, we had set up and jammed in that big, incredible Studio A. And we were living there. We were all living at the studio at, at the time. And, and it was, you know, a lot of laughing in the, in the, in the control room and, and hanging out kind of late and... And so I think he was into that. One of the, one of the things about Andy though is that he mixes incredibly qu quietly, mm. like as do all the great mix engineers I've ever worked with, <laughs> like El Elliot Shiner. And I'm talking about, I'm not, I'm not talking about kind of quiet. I'm talking about you can't even hear that the speakers are on kind of quiet. Wow. I think that's what he was saying. That's how you make something like Slayer Rain and Blood sound heavy. You know, they he, they make it super quiet, and then they get everything sitting in the perfect place, and then when you crank it up, it sounds amazing. Wow. Oh, okay. Wow. I didn't, didn't know that but stuff. It's a little unsatisfying in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> like, Can I hear that? Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> Birds is the first one that uh, is a full band collaboration. Birds of a feather, and very collaborative. Very collaborative. That one. That yep. one was. That was really fun to do. I always kind of like the guitar solo on that album version. It's, it's a little bit weird. And there's yeah. some strange horn, horn writing on the outro, too, <laughs> do you, that I liked. Trey, do you remember what you were listening to at the time? Is there anything that sticks out in terms of influences at that time? Or was it, um, were you listening to a lot of different stuff? The biggest influence I'm going to that just popped into my head was probably King Sunny Ade, um, Synchro System. Hmm. Wow. Um, which, if you haven't heard that record and you're listening to the podcast, I, I would totally just download it or get it on, on uh, Spotify. Um, they came to um, Burlington in the 80s, and Fish and I went together to see them and stood in the front row and like danced like crazy. But there's 21 people in the band, and it's, and it's, a, it's that tapestry of sound layered thing. Wow, cool. And it cool. really changed my life, probably more than any other concert I've ever seen. And I've... I, put that album on in recording studios so many times with engineers and tried and said, this is what I, this is what it should sound like. It's kind of was the model for tab too. It's just like a lot of people playing small parts that fit together. Uh, so that was probably the biggest influence. Awesome. I'm sure I was playing that for Andy. That's amazing. That's amazing. Moving on. We have uh, meat came after birds. Love meat. I love meat. If I have a ghost about a can I fly in on my street? I drive just to stay alive and offer them some meat. If I had a ghost to play in on my street, I drive just to stay alive and offer them some meat. I love that that Mike sings it and says, "I am a prince. I have it all." <laughs> I know. I, I, I hear your I hear your footsteps through the through the wall. Yeah, I wait in silence for your call. Then take. A oh, shot. I wait in silence yeah. for your call. <laughs> yeah. Then take a shot and watch you fall. <laughs> That's what it is. Good stuff. Well, you know, you have to interpret it as you will. Yeah, exactly. I take a shot, meaning I, I, I'm of oh, whiskey. I make an attempt. <laughs> yeah, I'll take a shot. <laughs> He's got. Um, a, he actually has a basketball hoop in yeah. his living room. Um, and then, of course, uh, Gaiuti, one of your 
you know, you sort of revive the long tray, completely written out, experimenting with classical songwriting in Gaiu. Yeah. I guess there's always there's often one of those. I kind <laughs> there, of, there, I kind of write I kind of write that way for. I have another one right now that I'm in the middle of actually that I'm kind of psyched about. Nice. But I, I write that way for 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 joy. Mm -hmm. Right. Meaning that's just what I do. Mm -hmm. If left to my own devices, yeah. You know, I would write "Divided Sky" or "You Enjoy Myself" or or Gaiuti or you know Petrichor or um, "Time Turns Elastic" or that kind of stuff. It's the weirdest thing, but it's kind of like the easiest. It comes to me more easily than anything else. So. Often you write it for more instruments than are in Fish. And I always kind of like hearing uh, the version with strings and horns and all this stuff. And then hearing how it's resolved on stage with four musicians. It's awesome. Awesome. What, um, often what happens for me when that happens, so this is just a funny thing. The moment that excites me is the addition of the incredible John Fishman. Mm. Ah, like mm -hmm. Pet Petrichor and Time Turns Elastic were both completely charted out, completely, utterly charted out. I even had a demo made that if you heard it, it's almost identical to what's on the record. All the parts, keyboards, bass, everything, except for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> the incredible John Fishman. <laughs> the, the astounding John Fishman. <laughs> so, so you kind of add that to the picture. I'm just... I'm in a band with him, but I'm I'm his biggest fan. I'm telling you, I get to stand next to him every night. And, and <laughs> you know, like, you know, the drumming, if you listen to the album version of, there's this one bit in the middle of Petrichor where it sounds like, like um, it reminds me of sort of Adam Hart Mother by Pink Floyd, where it's like, dun, 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 dun. And he's like, Bla, boom, boom, bip, 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 boom, 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 It's so good. <laughs> So maybe I just write those really long things just so that I can hear John Fishman play them. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. Tra tra and there's no other reason. You've always told me two things about John Fishman. Uh, and one of them is best drummer in the world uh, by far. And you always add by far. <laughs> and uh, the other one is if you watch him play, his shoulders don't move. <laughs> his whole torso doesn't move. <laughs> He's just like an octopus. It's with... incredible. It's very strange and, and... to watch. Yep. He's not like lots of drummers get on there and they look like they're doing like calisthenics, you know, uh, mm -hmm. not, not Fishman. He also plays the, he plays the drums like a musical instrument, not like something he's whacking on. Ah, mm -hmm. wow. Do you know what I'm trying to say? He's not beating them to death. Yes. And, and, and if you listen to great jazz drummers, they play the drums like that. They get a big sound with a, with a light touch. Mm -hmm. Well, lest, lest people think we're beating this subject to death, let's move on a little bit. Uh, and that's, that's my fault, not yours, Try. I really love hearing what, what, what you have to say. But we have now only talked about four songs, and there's another ten. Okay. <laughs> cool. Uh, so cool. Ficus, it's a band collaboration song. I put a star next to it. So Ficus was one, uh, again, my lyrics, but you guys wrote to, in that jam session. Yes, we wrote that at Davos Farm. That was one of the first ones we did at Davos, Ficus. 
was probably number one. Like a strange dream for me It cost me nothing, it was free He dreamed of walking in the sand Of blossoms forming in his hand it's, uh, it's one of the ones I found on um, Wikipedia that I think I say something that comes off as an insult about it, and I didn't really mean it that way. And and I think I, I think if I say it this way, it's true that maybe another song could have replaced it. I just I just remember. I thought I said that on Wikipedia because <laughs> we both said it. it I, my name yeah. my name is written there as as one. Oh, of it was probably you then. It wasn't I mentioned me. something about Fike. It was dumb. It was totally. Dumb. But, I, but but I did say uh, that you know here's something that still is true. I listened to that album, the CD, in my car, and I I used to commute almost an hour each way. I listened to that CD, Story of the Ghost, probably more than any CD I've ever heard. Ficus, I hate to say it, Ficus and Shafty were one touch skips for me because right after that was limb by limb. So I went from Gaiuti oh, and then skip Ficus, skip Shafty. I, I, I hate to say it, although I'm a co-writer, so I'm allowed you can to say, say it. it. <laughs> well, you all, well, there's two things to say about that. And, and I'll just chime in on, on the Ficus thing. Okay. Well, first of all, part of the reason that you skipped over Shafty is because we had already recorded Olivia's Pool. Is that when you're there, you can't even tell As you move through this life you love so That you could be there and not even know And you say, so what? I'm doing just fine The irony is that it's all in your mind And right. you're probably kind of like, this is just Olivia's pool with a different drum beat. And you know what I mean? Right. So that was probably our dipping the toe into the water of the Davos farmhouse. But for me, I, I actually have a really loving, fond place for Ficus. I, I just, it cracks me up. And it, again, it brings me back to how fun it was writing and sitting there with Mike with the, in the farmhouse and all writing together. I think what was hard, and this story is probably important to be told, was that when we walked in to do the album, Story of the Ghost, there's always a whiteboard on the wall. The whiteboard, you know, a magic eraser board. Mm -hmm. And you write down all the potential songs. There's always about 18 and they slowly get cut if anybody has a problem with one of them or something. So Fish has a grand tradition of cutting what some people might think are the best songs. Last album, Mercury got cut. I, I don't know if everybody likes it. That's just me speaking. I particularly do like it. <laughs> um, more was cut and I made them put it back on. That was, that was, um, from the last album. And, um, but the thing about Story of the Ghost was that since we had just come out of the farmhouse, um, let me see, Twist, Farmhouse, Bug, Dirt, Heavy Things, and I think there was one more. We're all on the whiteboard for Story of the Ghost. Piper. Piper too? Piper, yes. And there, I still think there was one more. Wow. I think if I looked at the list, I could find it along with all the songs that made it on the story of the ghost. So one by one, those ones got cut. And I remember feeling my heart, when Bug got cut, I was kind of like, oh. It was just like, oh my God, <laughs> just stabbed me. And then when Twist got cut, it was like, oh my God. But <laughs> it was really important to all four of us at that time that we make an album that was co-written by everybody. Mm -hmm. And to be perfectly honest, I think it was and still is way more important than that those other songs ended up i mean it was fine it was mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. but you, you you know what i'm trying to say so that's kind of why you know ficus was written by all four of us right and twist was written by me and you uh right and i would almost go as far as to say that i was pushing that agenda more than anybody because i was a little bit almost like i don't know if embarrassed is the right word but i know like like when we were doing Hoist, I had so many songs that you and I had written and there just weren't a lot of other songs available at that point in time by the other band members. It wasn't like a, like a gang up thing. 
you know, right. like as soon as Paige started writing songs, they all end up on records now. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Yes. Mm-hmm. He yep. just didn't bring any to the table. And so like Wolfman's brother kind of has like a co-written, you know, uh, credit on Hoist. I think that was the one. Yeah. And But it wasn't really. You and I wrote that song. and, and But it just looked weird that there all these songs were by me and you. And, and I think that by the time we got the story of the ghost, it was like the most important thing, just as it was before Fuego too, where Fuego was another one. We were like, we're going in and we're writing together. It's, you know, the mm-hmm. four of us are going to sit down with pads. We're going to write together. And, and there's room for all the songs to emerge. So all the songs that got cut from story of a ghost ended up six months later being recorded up at the barn for farmhouse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It just ended up being two albums instead of one, you know, and, and in that sense, you know, some of the kind of quieter, weird things that the four of us did together with your lyrics on, on Ficus um, were my favorite things. Like, I love End of Session. Love. And Absolutely. we wrote that together. Yeah. So I, I, I wouldn't rather have I wouldn't rather have twists on that record on, on Story of the Ghost than End of Session, because I think End of Session is appropriate for Story of the Ghost. It was, you know, the right song. Right. That's a long answer, but I don't know. It could have been Sand, maybe the other one you were reaching for. Well, Sand, see, when I went in to do Farmhouse, I had those remaining six songs, and then I needed three more to make an album, and me and Russ and Tony had just got together and written Sand, Got It Too, and First Tube, Sand with Your Lyrics. Got it. So, again, from the book. And then those other two were just me and Russ and Tony. And so I put those on there right? just to round it out because there weren't any other songs floating around. It all works out in the end, you know? I don't think Simple is on an album, you know? Come on. Uh, <laughs> simple, right. Simple. Some, some of your best stuff wasn't... It, it, some of Fish's best stuff isn't on albums, which is, which is great. Fish's, well, Fish's greatest hits are not on albums. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've written a lot of songs. I, looking back, they, they all came out. The ones that are supposed to come out came out. It right. kind of doesn't really... Uh, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't change a thing is what I'm saying. Me I, either. Yeah. No, me either. Yep. And going back to Ficus now, I love Ficus when I hear it. I have to be the one that defends my Ficus statement. And that is, if I heard it live now, I would be the happiest guy in the arena. Um, it, it was just I had... <laughs> I think we did it a couple of years. It was just I had a little... It's just I had a little push button thing happening whenever it came on <laughs> the CD. Because the other stuff around it, to me, was uh, like, uh, I wanted to hear it more at that time. Which well, brings- there's, a, there's a weird thing too that, that I'll add to this conversation, which is that since we, then we've been doing this for so long, particularly yeah. like you and I, yeah, for so long, I mean, our entire lives since we were like, how old are you in fifth grade? Yeah, uh, you're 10. You know? Yeah. Yeah, you're 10. So I've kind of started to develop, usually I can tell as soon as a song is written, if it's, I have a pretty good feeling whether or not it's going to connect in a certain way. Yeah. Like I remember like bouncing around the room. It's like, that was, uh, you know, um, uh, lawn boy was done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, we got to go back in and do this song. And the same thing with the wedge <laughs> rift was done. And we went back into the studio to, and I was like, we got to do this song. Cause I think this is going to be good live. Yeah. Like, see, this is a strange thing. And I'll say this too. I mean, I'm always, always, always thinking about live. Mm-hmm. Like I make mm-hmm. albums in order, like I like making albums, but it's a little bit ass backwards that I, 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 when we're making an album, I'm trying to think of like how this is going to fit into the fabric of the live show. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I think I thought, like, I think I thought twist was going to work live and we had just the cycling vocals and the whole thing that had just happened. That had been such an amazing night and I had been living with it and the other guys had kind of just heard it. And, and so it kind of got voted off, you know? But it didn't, it didn't matter. It's like, it's completely irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as long as it gets from point A to point B, point A is writing and point B is, is into the, into the song list. Into the song yeah. list. That's funny because yeah. I say that, uh, 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 lyrics that I write have three birth cycles. One is if I put, put it down on paper, <laughs> then, then that's birth number one. <laughs> the second is if you and I turn it into a song, that's birth number two, it becomes a song. And then three is if it becomes a fish song. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> Trey, um, there's some important things that we have to talk about uh, just to also give the audience an idea of how kind of magical um, this album creation 
was. And cool. You yes. guys had you guys had that. gone to Bearsville to record Billy Breathes, which some say is your American Beauty, right? And uh, you had an amazing uh, producer, Steve Lillywhite. And yes. it was a magical, magical experience at Bearsville, which is like this uh, compound on a hill with multiple studios and multiple beautiful houses and, and barns. And then you went back to do The Ghost. And uh, Trey, please tell us a little bit about Bearsville and what was going on and how it's so magical and why it's so cool. Bearsville was invented, uh, invent, Bearsville was started by Albert Grossman, who was Bob Dylan and the band and Janis Joplin and their manager. He was a famous manager in the 60s. He built Bearsville in 1969. It's on a big uh, bucolic compound. It's in the middle of the woods and it's about two hours north of New York. So it became sort of a retreat. A lot of great people played there. The Stones used to use it as a rehearsal space. You know, REM did some of their most famous records there. Like there was, it was a cool place. When we went there, Sue and I, and I think you slept over, stayed in what was called Robertson House, which was actually Robbie Robertson's old house. It was just a vibey place. And, um, and Studio A had a big Neve console in it. I think 44 channels that was built for the Who. And, and it's, it was a huge old fashioned cement walled echo chamber, which is the way they used to build studios. So that's where we did all the late night hangs that were the jams that ended up being, um, oh, it's the sick at this. And it also has a barn at the bottom half of the studio. That's, that's where we did Billy Breeze in, in the bar. Right. Um, um, I have a funny story about Bearsville, which is that while we were, it was in the barn or maybe while we were up there doing story of the ghost um the slick rick who was like a rap legend yeah uh was in the other studio and and i was being you know i, I always like to go say hi so i was like i'm going it's you know 11 o'clock at night we were hanging out you know I'm like i'm gonna go see slick rick <laughs> like we're walking down there and i went in he was in the barn and we were at studio a that's what it was mm -hmm. and it was like this huge pass like all this gang of people and everybody's like big billows of smoke and everything. And they had this big, loud rap beat going on, like boom, 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 boom. And the guy was writing in the pad and it was Slick Rick and all this stuff. And I kind of was like, hi, I'm up in the studio. <laughs> I'm the guy <laughs> and, they, and their reaction was so funny because they were, they were like, you walk down here? And I said, yeah. They're like, aren't you afraid of all the animals like the wild <laughs> the bears <laughs> yeah they're like I mean, no i'd be afraid if i was walking through you know the south bronx at three o'clock in the morning but yeah, i'm not afraid of the, the bears <laughs> so these guys were like they, yeah. they they were city guys who had never been in the woods yeah they didn't like being in the woods. <laughs> that, so that's kind of a funny thing but uh and also when we were up at bearsville up at the studio a we met levon helm on that on that trip, which is really cool. Wow. Yeah. You know, amazing. Yeah, he was hanging around. I mean, so Bearsville, yeah, Bearsville was great. It's closed now. It's not, they don't have studios like that anymore. Unfortunately, the technology has changed and it's easy to record sort of on your computer. So a lot of those studios went out of business. Trey, I, let, but, me, let me interject my one fan uh, fanboy story, meeting a star. And I think you can uh, explain how it happened uh, after I tell it. Um, but basically, uh, Paige and I, you guys were playing a lot of chess. You were challenging the audience to chess. Yes. Chess was everywhere. And I loved chess. I was having chess nights back at home in Princeton. Um, and so I was okay. You guys were good. I was, I was, I could give you guys a good game. And, uh, Paige and I, uh, squared off. We were playing outside the, uh, second floor, um, balcony, uh, overlooking kind of a parking lot attached to, uh, Studio A. And uh, we were playing, and I think the rest of you guys had gone somewhere. And uh, this car pulled up. It's kind of a piece of shit car, nothing special. And uh, out of the out of the driver's seat, Chrissy Hind. And uh, Paige, no hesitation, just said, "Hi, Chrissy." Kind of like it was the, you know, the most oh. common most common thing in the world to to see Chrissy Hind. And I was blown away. And uh, I didn't say anything. I just kind of looked at her like, oh, my God, that is fucking Chrissy Hind. <laughs> and she had the funniest. <laughs> uh, she pointed at Paige. She looked up and pointed at Paige. And all the dudes in her car kind of stopped and looked up, too. She pointed at Paige and she goes, and I think she might have been explaining it or asking Paige a question, explaining it either to the guys or asking Paige. And she pointed and she goes, fish? 
And Paige nodded. And then she pointed at me. And without even having to ask, she goes, not fish. And and the reason that she knew that it was fish. Yeah. yeah, How did she know? A couple of days earlier. This is so funny that, that that happened to you. We were up on the second floor balcony. That was the apartment that we lived in above the studio. And we were sitting there playing chess. And just like, you know doing nothing, playing chess and eating sandwiches. And um, <laughs> the door just flew open. It was our apartment. It's, <laughs> the f- door flew open and Chrissy Heim came walking into the apartment dressed in the full pretender's regalia. Oh my like God. with the hair done up and the, like the fluffy shirt and the blazer, makeup, the whole thing. Whoa. And it was so weird. We were kind of like, Oh, hey, Chrissy Hine, what are you doing in our apartment? And it turns out that she was doing a photo shoot uh, and she had gone in the wrong door. <laughs> she just walked into our apartment. So then we kind of got talking. Uh, that explains it. Wow. That explains so it. So that, that, that's how we met. So that's how she already knew Paige and didn't know me. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, but, um, Trey, you've... Uh, other things uh, about Bearsville or is that... Uh, that's really great about Bearsville. That's a good description. Uh, yeah, it's like, you know, when I, I got to visit uh, and stay for a few days, like you said, with, with Trey in the Robbie Robertson house, uh, it was an incredible honor. And then prior to that, I got to meet one of my idols, uh, Steve Lillywhite, when they were doing um, Billy Breathes. So that place has a fondness in my heart. And also at the time, we would go out as like the, oh. the band would go out in town and find this really cool uh, bars and clubs and stuff in Woodstock. We used to go to almost every night, the whole time we were doing Billy Breeds and then the whole time we were doing Story of the Ghost. At the end of the night, we would go to this place called Pinecrest. Yes. Hmm. Which was kind of like walking into like a Twin Peaks, <laughs> an episode <laughs> of Twin Peaks. Yes. And they had a jukebox and it had um, Telegram Sam by T-Rex on it. And Oh. I just have such fun every night. We like go in and like, you know, go to the bar and then put on Telegram Sam. <laughs> and Sicket was there with us. I remember we used to do that. Yeah. And that, oh, just a sidelight, you know, that, 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 um, John Sicket, our engineer who engineered uh, and mixed Billy Breeze, mm-hmm. um, that was actually Sicket's car on the cover of the Sicket disc. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> So that was probably some night after the pine crest. That, <laughs> that, that sort ended of up against points the to the amount of partying that was happening. Kind of. <laughs> I think we also didn't we play? Did we play at the Joyous Lake one night? Yes. Yeah. You guys played six. as as yeah. ass face, right? Was that? Yes. Ass? I mean, that's the main thing you got to know about Bearsville, and even the Chrissy Hines story. I think she's from around there. I'm not exactly sure. And, and you know, Levon Helm lived right there. It's right near Woodstock, so you know. The whole thing was kind of, you know, that story's been told a million times about all the New York musicians who kind of moved up there. Yep. Created little artists. It's an enclave, a big, a beautiful pink, enclave. Big Pink is, is probably, you know, a mile away or something. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, the songs that we didn't mention. Uh, limb mention by, them, because I have a couple l- things to say. Limb by Limb. Love Limb by Limb. Love Limb by Limb. And now it's time to talk about lyrics. Uh-oh. Okay. First of all, Limb by Limb, some of my absolutely all-time favorite Tom lyrics, and I think Tom Scott lyrics. In yep, that Scott Herman uh, credited on that song, for sure. I want that on my tombstone, my, my favorite line possibly ever in a fish song. Um, uh, Tossed with a salad and bailed with a hay. <laughs> and I'll, and I'll do, I'll do uh, Trampled by Lambs and Pecked by the Dove on mine. And can I say one more thing about that? Because that, if you listen to the Trampled by Lands and Pecked by the Dove version of that song, it's pretty locked in. But the cool thing about that was that the drum beat, okay, yeah, which was a drum beat that I that I built on a on a drum machine. Yes, I was listening to. I wanted to find drum drum beats that were um, celebratory drum beats. So I was listening to these Smithsonian recordings of, of street music at, during Carnival in Brazil. Oh, my God. And there was gangs of people. And they were going, boom, 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 boom. Like one guy was hitting the bass drum. If you imagine that drum beat, it was a whole street full of people. And then I put it all on little 
jotted it all down on paper first. Boom, 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 boom. That was like a party, the sound of a party. Right. And then I built it on the drum machine and brought it to the farmhouse. And then we, and then we, we wrote limb by limb on top of that drum beat. And then the world's greatest drummer, as he as he did many other times, including like the wedge was another drum beat that was written on. Bouncing around the room was another drum beat that was written on. These drum beat I'd bring these drum beats on on drum machines, and then the world's greatest drummer would take them and learn them exactly, and then like extrapolate times a million. Right. And some of these were drum Just beats that Trey thought you know, couldn't be played by a human and, and fishman. I, dr- I fantasize about playing them. Uh, you know, I'm like a wannabe drummer and that'd be, if I could play the drums, that's how I would play the drums. And I could never do that. And fish would go and unlike any drummer I've ever worked with, I've tried that with other drummers. No one will actually go and learn it. He, he always does. wants to learn it, always wants more. And he'll learn these things and just soak them into his incredible vocabulary of drumming. He comes and back just, the next day like, uh, uh, and, and he knows it, but he's been playing it all night. <laughs> and then he comes back the next day and knows it. Yeah. Yep. If you go backstage at a Fish concert, he's practicing the drums for three hours before he goes on stage. Hmm. Jesus. The sound of Fish backstage is the sound of a Fish concert backstage is the sound of Fish playing the drums. Yep. <laughs> and, I've known him since I was 18. He was the best man at my wedding. He's the first person I met when I went to UVM. He was practicing the drums the day I met him. (laughs) I called him yesterday. He was practicing the drums. (laughs) And he calls me up and asks for more. Wow. He's like, man, you got any weird beats or something? And then he's just like, so he's like a sponge. And then he listens to albums and does it. Holy shit. He's amazing. He's amazing. He is amazing. <laughs> All right. Can I can I tell a really quick story? Yes. Um, Trey, yes. I, had, I had the opportunity to meet um, Del McCurry last weekend. <clears throat> Del, oh. and, Del and Ronnie. And um, Ronnie told me a story that he said that um, he met Fishman at a festival or at a show. And, and maybe it was when you guys were, when they had played with you guys. And Fishman said, I learned the drums um, listening to you guys. And he and Ronnie said, we, we don't have drums. And he said, I know, I, I made them up. Um, I made them up to all your songs, and he he still remembered that to this day. Yeah, it's Pretty like awesome. that. Like I I talked to him yesterday, I think, or two days ago, and he was learning the drums off this great album that both he and I were in love with for a while, which is a Mark Rebo album called Los Cubanos. Um, I can't remember the whole title, Los Cubanos something. It's like a Cuban musicians and Mark Rebo. And he called me like two days ago. I said, oh man, I'm learning these drum beats. I'm sure he he learned all the imaginary drum beats in Del McCroy's <laughs> band. That's crazy. You know? <laughs> so it's pretty fun to see how they're like all, it's all sort of blending into this style that nobody else has. Now. It's like a really unique style that he plays. All right. Uh, after Limb by Limb, Frankie says, Brian and Robert, water in the sky. Great. Okay. Go Frankie says... Nice song that I think we jam that came out of I think the jams yep. the jam sessions yep, that's not not the, not Davo's farmhouse but the jams okay oh god like the stick of disc jams next two are water in the sky and Brian and Robert yep my greatest um, sense of pride in my friend Tom for those two songs I absolutely adore the lyrics to Brian and Robert I think it's some of your best lyrics. Um, <laughs> And it makes me, I, I love singing that song and I'm, I'm like honored. I love what it's about. I love, I love the, the person that it's celebrating so much. And I adore singing Water in the Sky because I think it's like as close a, a message of, to what I, the kind of spirituality that I have yeah. as you could possibly verbalize. Well, that's like the nicest thing anyone's ever said about 
any of my songs and, and <laughs> you say that to me so much and Trey it means it, it, it never loses its meaning when you say it but uh, Brian and Robert to me too uh, I have to say something magic happened there and uh, it's like so such a simplistic song and uh, it, it just it really comes together and on this album it's such a powerful I love it I love what Fish does I love the band right. behind it's so beautiful staring at your walls observing echoing footfalls from tenants wandering distant halls then this one is for you if children Everything is like I, I, understated I and gorgeous. It. Yeah. Yep. I, I and it's the lyrics get better the older I get. Yeah. There's I can a, relate. I can relate to them. There's like, a, there's lonely people out there, year. right? There's people out there, and uh, you know somehow I, I think I, I think I needed to write about one in particular, and I don't really remember who it was, but I think there was a person that I was thinking right. about. It could have been me. I was lonely, you know. High school, <laughs> I had some lonely times. Um, That's well, for sure. And w- water in the sky. Uh, kind of to my daughter, sort of an expression of love in a way, and yet also to something more ethereal. Roguet. Love Roguet. And Roguet, um, one of my favorites to play, and um, that was a very much a, a group think. Yep. Um, some mining of the prints for lines and four band members at Davos Farmhouse p- passing the microphone around in a circle. I don't know where that one line came from, but but <laughs> it could have been just a moment to like, you know, a spur of the moment joke. But I love Gordon. G- Gordon knew the moment. <laughs> and the stars all turned yeah, around. yeah. <laughs> and from that vantage point, I frowned. From that vantage point, I frowned. <laughs> Gordon knew the moment. Yeah, I don't think I wrote that. I think you guys wrote that, which is yeah, fantastic. We probably had that one. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> Velvet <laughs> Sea, we already talked about. MoMA Dance, Love Trey. That. Now, MoMA Dance, I think it was either from those jam sessions or it, it was Black Eyed Katie before it became MoMA Dance. Yeah, yeah it was. And I, but was Black Eyed Katie 98 or was that 97? 97. That, that we had already been playing that. Yeah, but it just, we just made more Gave MoMA it, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then end of session. End of session.
and the session. We played it at the Baker's Desert. Yeah, I, I actually wanted to ask, did you, was that like a purposeful sort of bust out? That was the only time you guys have ever played it live. So was that like a spur of the moment kind of thing or had you been playing around with it? Well, there was like a lot of, I spent a lot of time thinking about the 13 night song mm -hmm. list mm -hmm. for a lot of really interesting reasons. But I think when the idea first came up, it had come up before, but about a year before the Baker's does, and I sort of made this phone call to management. I was like, okay, it's time. You got to do it. Like, fine. And then when it happened, I remember floating the idea to the, to the guys. Like, I don't want to do any repeats. Mm -hmm. And there was definitely a little bit of like, you know, do we have to do that? There was a little bit like, that's kind of scary. And he said, you know, yes. it's a lot of nights. It seems and scary. so I spent a lot of time thinking about it and writing, like I had poster boards all over my house and colored pens. And I would like wake up at six in the morning and drink coffee and kind of crawl around on the floor. <laughs> I had like a hundred poster boards and they're just <laughs> all over the place and scratching out and changing and searching. And you know what I mean? Yeah. Trey, this Trey I want work. those poster boards. Yeah, I, I, you know what? I, I think I threw them all out too. Damn it. <laughs> I wish I had, uh, but I have pictures of them. I that's, do have pictures of that's them. That's really cool though. <laughs> Sue was making fun of me after a while because she was saying it was starting to look like that movie, A Beautiful Mind. Yeah, 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 totally. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when she came in, I was like, but, so, and then it kept changing and changing and changing and changing, like all the way up. And then it seemed like a chance to break out some songs. And those were kind of my favorite ones, you know, like songs that we didn't do very often. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what started to happen was you can't like, it's still Saturday night at, a, at Madison Square Garden. You know what I'm saying? So there's an energy, you know, and yeah. suddenly that energy gets filled with like dog stole things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which I thought was pretty rocking. Yeah. You know, and so that was kind of the work, the searching, the searching was like, we must have more songs and then you know and then i went up to burlington and everybody played them and then it started getting a mind of its own like the whole thing just kind of took on a mind of its own so. that's amazing uh, it was really fun. that's really cool to hear about trey from a fan perspective and this is sort of a weird observation and i don't know how you're gonna think about this if you think this way at all <clears throat> but if you like look back at like all the peaks fish's peaks and they could be you know performance or an album came out or whatever it is but to me there's like one amazing shining peak and probably a, another now which is so incredible that it's uh, so recent in your career uh and that would be big cypress and uh baker's dozen you know two, right twin peaks dude twin peaks well funnily about ghost i think ghost in a certain way was mike's album meaning hmm. the bass the just bass. the bass oh, i think yes. the bass sounds amazing on that record and i think that in 97 he kind of, I mean, he's so amazing. And, but I think that era was when he kind of found this. Was that the uh, certain heaviosity that, that, that has never left. I and it's always been great. From a fan perspective, agree completely agree. I mean, that's when his bass became much more prominent, but also like the, his effects. I mean, it just became a much bigger part of the, of the sound. Totally. I completely agree. He, he like, and I love the bass on story of the ghost, like right from the beginning, all of it. And, um, and, and, and it just stayed that way. And it's always been such a huge thing. Did what move? I wanted to add to that was one of the things that I think made the Baker's dozen a success for me was I think the page had like this massive step forward. Um, two things to me, to my ear, one was when he played with the meters, which sort of like, he, and it just felt something different when he came back. There was like certain, like certain kind of like, like a kind of a step out thing that kind of happened from that. Beautiful. And then, and then if you listen closely, he widened like his array of sounds about two tours ago, which I think the tour before the Baker's Dozen and those long jams at the Baker's Dozen. You know, he's switching textures so much more frequently. Like, you more, know, he goes more liberally piano. going into the uh, into the synthesizer realm too, which is yes. beautiful. Yeah, yeah totally. a lot more synthesizer realm. A lot of different synthesizers. 
a lot more of various kind of roads and whirlies mm -hmm. for whole long segments. And I think there's these like, I just think it is such a, such a cool thing and, and uh, enables some of those like long, like, like the blaze on or the simple jams at Baker's Dozen. If you really listen closely, mm -hmm. a lot of it has to do, you know, when it was more kind of piano clav, piano clav. Now, every time he switches keyboards, it's like shifting gears in the whole band. The whole band shifts gears. Yeah. Like goes, and it's a whole new, like the palette. It's like he's painting with a new color. And everybody totally, else kind of follows that color. Totally. I totally agree. Page is just in a great, it's just in such a good place. And, you know, we spend a lot of time together on the road. We kind of hang. I've never, I've never been know. able as a keyboardist, never been able, I've always marveled at, um, uh, you know, like you called it a tapestry, I believe just now, uh, yeah. Page increased his tapestry and yet it doesn't sound like there's never a cheesiness. Like there's never like, you know, the, the, the eighties bands when the, the, the goofy keyboard guy goes onto the other keyboard and like, oh, yeah. yeah, you know what I mean? It's never, it's always very artistic and, and subtle and understated. And yet he knows how to play every one of them expertly. He started kind of going there also on Fuego. And if you, there's a lot of really cool keyboard textures. And another thing that was interesting that happened was he always had a great keyboard tech, but that Kevin retired and he got another new younger keyboard mm -hmm. tech. And according to Paige, I hope this isn't giving away too many secrets, but according to Paige, he was kind of, this guy was enthusiastic for Paige to bring some of his home keyboards on the road. Hmm. Paige said, like, it was kind of like his whole sonic, because Paige is a real, really picky about that, those sounds that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard him go off on it a lot of times. He hates those cheesy synth sounds. So all the synth sounds that he uses and are like super organic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, but in order to have all those organic, they, they kind of each do one thing. You've got to kind of bring all these things on the road. And a lot of them are old and antique and fragile. Uh, which <laughs> and they need the to be maintained every day and tuned. And yeah. You've got this uh, really enthusiastic new keyboard tech that, that the two of them are having like a real renaissance over there. And, and, and also the organ even started sounding better. And everything just, I just think he's like leading the charge over there. I, I was watching a, a streaming version of one of the big nights of the baker's dozen and i, I could have sworn that some of those keyboards were fake because there were so many of them and i was like you can't possibly have that many machines over there but you can tell like that he's added on he added a whole bunch and it's so it's so cool that you notice all these things <laughs> i didn't know if people were noticing these things but no they're all real and they're they're um antique and collectible Hmm. And, and, you know, it'd be real easy and virtually anybody that you see out there on the road will have like a, a grand piano shell with a digital piano inside of it. Right. Right. Virtually everyone, you know, that you see Billy Joel or anybody that's a, that's a digital piano inside a shell. Oh. And Paige just won't go there. It's a real piano that has to be tuned twice a day and then in between sets and all those keyboards could be on one digital recreation keyboard. Ha, huh. wow. You, but they don't sound as good. I mean, the only way mm -hmm. you can get the real sound, those things are like, you know, built, you know, you have to carry them. And that thing that you were seeing, they're all, they're all real. And they're, it's the only way you can get those kind of sounds. One of the, one around. of the best examples for me, and, and this is an incredible coming from me because I don't remember concerts. I don't remember songs. I don't remember set lists. But I do remember a MoMA dance where, and this was early in the Baker's Dozen, maybe maybe night three or four, where uh, all of a sudden I was really blown away by Paige. And this was probably a 10 minute jam, 10 minute song. So I would say around right. minute seven or eight, all of a sudden Paige switched to a different keyboard and it was electrifying. But I don't, right? it was subtle electrifying. He just went into this weird, amazing, moogie, kind of uh, beautiful pad sound. And I was just like, right. Oh my God. And you guys responded. It was just a beautiful moment. Listen to that MoMA dance and listen all the way through because this comes late in the game. Uh, check that I, out for, from Tommy. That's from Tom. Totally <laughs> hear what you're saying. And, and, and I, I kind of like, I think it's the refresh button. 
Mm. <laughs> he's the ref- you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. like every time he switches keyboards, it's like a whole new paragraph mm. or something or chapter. Mm-hmm. And it, oh. it kind of reminds me of, I think it's kind of, I don't think it's, it's copying or reminiscent, but it's a little more like Pink Floyd textures now. Yes. Hmm. Okay. Which is, you know what I mean? Which is exactly where I want him to be, but I would never say right. that. And also, yeah, I mean, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface talking about his unbelievable um, Hammond technique, but let's not do that. And right sound. Yeah. yeah. And by the go back and listen to how much better that Hammond set sounds in the last two tours than it ever has before. It's blown. It blew me away every night of the Bakers. Right. It's every a new single. Hammond or, and this guy he's working with just like, wow. Like, you know, the two of them, it sounds so much, it sounds so much better. It's That's really, awesome. I'm, you Trey, know, Trey, noticeable. We took an hour of your time. I'm not going to cut any of this. It was amazing. Uh, and thank you so much. And thank you, Trey. I want to ask you one last question. And I, yes. as a fan, I want to say, I mean, this, I'm not just saying this cause you're on the phone. I would say this to Tom, if you weren't on the phone, but you guys are, uh, the sound is, is incredible right now. And it's, it's an, it's a wonderful experience for all of us to get to continue to go to shows. So thank you. Um, I want to ask just what, what it what was it like walking off stage on that last night of the dozen, just because you guys had, I mean, like you said, you must've been planning this for what, nine, nine months at least. I mean, was it, yeah. was it a sense of relief and, and wonder or what, what, it, what was that like? Okay. Let's try to say this without getting choked up and, and like, uh, but the whole from the beginning, I talked to Paige yesterday, I was still talking about this. <laughs> There was something tangible and noticeable about what's happened to the whole community of fish. It's been like a shift in our perspective of watching and being blown away by the friendships and the stuff that's start that's happening. You know, we, we know people, but we don't. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, but there was a there was a feeling I thought the four of us thought this and we talked about it that was so um maybe it's because we played there so many times or maybe i don't know but it was like we were at some kind of social community event that we were a part of (laughs) and the way people were reacting to to things that were so subtle and you could feel the reaction you know, you can mm-hmm. hear it on the tapes, like, you know, some kind of something that would take years and years and years to get to the point where anybody would notice that it was even something to react to. <laughs> right. Um, you, you know, you know, OK, so sample goes an extra 16 bars. <laughs> yeah. like, oh. And we're like, and we're like, oh, my God, like, everybody's like, let's keep going. You know, <laughs> like, you're like, it was symbiotic. It's like symbiotic and and old meaning like two trees growing together and wrapping around or something or you know what i mean and and so that's kind of what it felt like and and the and the comfort of the whole thing and the slowness and sitting and reading newspapers during harpua and <laughs> and, and i don't know it's that and also you know you know how long we've been friends is and I don't know, like I lost my best friend this year and then Ray, you know, keyboard player from Tab, got, he's great now, by the way, but he did have a very scary moment there. We were all very scared. Mm-hmm. You know, he got brain cancer, which is never a good thing yeah. to get. And you kind of get older and you start, you know, you know, appreciating your friends and, your, and even the ones that you aren't actually like on a first name basis with, but we kind of feel that way about people in our scene. You know, like we're part of this cool thing. Like you're a part of it, you know, you know, with the Helping Friendly podcast. Like, I hear about your podcast from Patrick, who's my manager. He's a big fan. He wow. listens to it all the time. Wow. And he's like, when I, if I ever need to know, actually learn something about, you know, yeah, <laughs> really inside parts of fish, I listen to the Helping Friendly podcast. It's like, <laughs> I know incredible. about, we know about what's going on mm-hmm. and we feel like we're part of something. So I think when the Baker's yeah. Dozen ended, it was... I don't know, everybody was kind of like a little teary when we walked backstage. You know, just when I don't really know when you sang that Willie Nelson on the road. Oh, that was that was killing me. Yeah, <laughs> I was like trying to not sob. Oh, 
You know, and we, I think you start to yeah. you, you get you do get a sense of your. I'm not being morbid. I'm being a realistic person. We've been in a band for 35 years, and we're in our 50s, and nothing lasts forever. And I hope I hope this lasts a lot longer. I hope we're pl- all four playing when we're 90. But if you look around at bands with the original four members in their 35th year, yeah, how many are there? I mean, there are some. They're not a lot. There are so. I mean, ZZ Top is still going. Yeah. Yeah. I want to yeah. tell you, you too. You, you too. You too. And but a lot of and that's those it. two bands are all still cool. <laughs> There's other bands that still hang in there but don't like each other. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but we actually hang out and like you know they're my favorite people. Right. You know they're the smartest, funniest, fucking most amazing people I've ever met ever in my life. Ever. Yeah. I don't even know how. Uh, you're so lucky I, that you met. You guys are so lucky. I don't even know how that happened. I yeah. just, it's like. It's the best. Any one of the three of them. Any one of the three of them. Yep. <laughs> you, We're all, you know, we like, all feel very lucky too from we, this side. From the fan side, it's like amazing. I, and I'm in this amazing lucky place where, Trey, you're not even there. Where where I get to I get to be a fan too, which is uh, unbelievable. I've never seen fish, so I, I don't know. <laughs> I've never been to a concert. Never, I just see my rug. Never been to and, a fish show. <laughs> no, I don't have any idea what it looks like. I just basically see my rug and the same fifteen people on the front row. Yeah, right, right, right. The dudes, the dudes, <laughs> mostly dudes, <laughs> who I'm like best friends with, but I don't know any of their names. <laughs> I spent like more time in the vicinity. In the five foot vicinity of, of those the guys. front row of fish that I have, <laughs> probably with any other humans, ever in my life. <laughs> if you actually added it up, <laughs> it's really weird. <laughs> I know them all. I know them all so well. But that pizza pizza shirt guy, <laughs> uh, right? Exactly. <laughs> wow. Smiling yeah. person on the left. Yeah, <laughs> that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Smiling person on the left. I actually have a picture of, it's so funny, I have, I, have, I have three little pictures in my house. It's the only, the only, if you came to the house, there's no representation of the music career at all, except for three little pictures. One of them is like a big black picture with way in the tiny corner, there's like the four guys from Fish singing an acapella, hmm. but it's mostly ah, nice. blackface. And then next to it is a big picture that Patrick took during the Baker's Desert of the front row, of like not just the front row, the whole standing in the pit looking at the audience, what I see, exactly what I see. Oh my God. And everybody's like, it's just so cool. That's everybody's a great like, one. I want to, I want, I want to check that one out. It's such a good picture. I always kind of wish For the cameras, so many reasons. I wish the cameras would turn around a little bit more into the audience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Every now and then I kind of feel that way. <laughs> I mean, I'll send you a copy of it and you'll see <laughs> what I look at all night long. But it's so cool because everybody's looking up and there isn't one cell phone in the whole picture. That's awesome. Ah. That's fantastic. Everybody, there's just things about it that make me so happy. And that's everybody's in there having their experience together and like looking up. And there's, and it was there's no cell phones and, and everybody's like, I, I, I don't know, man. It just makes me so grateful to That's see, awesome. to be part of that. You know, they're not like, and there's like a, the right amount of space between people. I don't know. I can't explain it. <laughs> you don't have to explain it. We know. We're, We're going to see it. We're there. What, what's the third tray before we wrap up? You said there were three oh, pictures. It's a, it's a yeah, my favorite. It's this picture of Tab at Vegas with the, with the, with the MacArthur Park dancers and all of us in a row. So it's Jennifer. The third picture is Jennifer, Jennifer, James, Natalie, Tony, Russ, and Ray, nice. and Cyril. Awesome. Um, so there's one little picture of fish, that, and then, and then there's the rest of the house is you know my family and stuff. But I just <laughs> right. I have one little corner in in my man cave that I allow to be the uh, gratitude uh, gratitude for music corner. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I think you deserve it. You deserve a trade. Thank you so much for uh, answering all the questions and more for the podcast where we had kind of gone astray. <laughs> oh, man. Thanks, you guys, so much. And thanks to both of you. And we'll see you at the Gorge. Yes. I hope. You'll see me at Tahoe <laughs> and uh, RJ at Tahoe for sure. If we okay, make Tahoe's it to the Gorge, be it's only because we smuggled ourselves onto, your, uh, onto the bus. <laughs> <laughs> there's always room in the bay the luggage, where the luggage goes okay okay talk to you soon okay you. see ya bye 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 thanks Trey.
Osiris. This podcast is in the loop, the Legion of Osiris podcasts. Osiris is creating a community that connects people like you with live experiences and podcasts about artists and topics you love. Get in the loop at OsirisPod.com. Hold on. Timbo? Hold on, I'm trying to turn this fucking thing off. The the recorder? That was fun. I love it. I love what Fish does. I love the band right. behind it. It's so beautiful. If you're just staring at your walls, observing echoing footfalls from tenants wandering distant halls, then this one is for Everything is like I, I, understated I and gorgeous. It. Yeah. Yep. I, I, and it's the lyrics get better the older I get. Yeah. There's I can a, relate. I can relate to them. There's, like, a, there's lonely people out there, year. right? There's people out there. 